Hello, and welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm your host this evening, Brian Broom, and I'm joined by Emily Maxson and Greg Uttinger, and today we will be continuing our discussion on covenants and contracts and all those kinds of things, and specifically looking at the idea of consent, particularly as it relates to John Locke and the Enlightenment and all of that. So, Greg, why don't you get us started? <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> I know, it's a big order. It, it, it is, um, because this, this is one time when I don't have a specific text of Scripture or story to jump from, because we're kind of in the middle. Uh, we've been talking about covenant, which is a bond of life that we may by choice enter into if we're called by faith in our more mature years. We do believe for ourselves. God doesn't believe for us. We do receive baptism. On the other hand, those in the Presbyterian Reformed tradition are not opposed to baptizing babies and recognizing their place in the covenant, though they have not consented to anything. And then we can look at um, the world of contracts, and if you don't sign on the dotted line, it's not binding. And generally, except in the case of minors, interestingly enough, no one can sign for you. You, you have to sign for yourself. You have to give your consent. And then there's a the whole American system of government. We know that there are people who come from other countries and want to become American citizens, and they at some point give their consent. They swear an oath of allegiance to the Constitution and such. And there are even classes and tests they have to go through to get there. But then on the other hand, it is also true that anybody born within the territorial boundaries or political boundaries of the United States, for instance, a consulate or a military base, under certain, certain conditions at least, are automatically citizens. Whether they asked for it or not, well, they didn't ask for it because they were born there. And then comes the question as, as young people come of age, why do I have to obey the stupid government? I didn't vote for it. I didn't invent it. It wasn't my idea, and so on and so on. Normally, that comes after their first paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's yeah the, the moment they see all the withholdings, they're ready to start the American Revolution all over again. But it, it's a valid question insofar as it goes. But often the roots of it are not all that valid because man by nature wants to play God. That was the original temptation in the, in the garden. You shall be as God's deciding for yourself good and evil. The implication is that every sinner by nature says, if I don't agree to it, if I didn't sign on, if I didn't say okie dokie, then it doesn't bind me. Now, in certain edges of the Enlightenment, even that wasn't enough. Well, I agreed to it a year ago, but I now know stuff I didn't know then, so surely you don't expect me to be bound by that. That's another topic, sort of. Speak now in hard, hard words what you think today. <laughs> yeah. And speak tomorrow, in hard speak words what tomorrow. tomorrow thinks yeah, in, hard in hard words, words. again. Yeah. That would a contradict everything you said today. A foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. Yeah, because new enlightenment may come, and even your past consent may not be enough to bind you. It is, it's the consent of the moment. It's you as the autonomous individual, at this moment in time, if you reckon time, deciding what you want to do. Well, if you're God, that's great. If you're not, then we start having some problems real fast. Uh, back to the, just the simple question, again, of, of the young person who grows up, say, in the United States. I didn't uh, invent the Constitution. I didn't invent the kind of government we have here. I didn't agree to these amendments. I didn't agree to the, the civil laws, the statute laws, the common law behind it, the decisions of the courts. I didn't buy into all of America's political, economic, and social history. I exist in this moment of time, and I hereby disassociate myself from all of that so that I can do what I, at this moment, believe is right or safe or something. And suddenly the, word, <laughs> suddenly the words cancel culture are coming to my mind. I'm sure there's a tie <laughs> in there. I, the, the, aside from the scene in the garden, one, one passage did come to my mind, and feel free if you can, if others register with you. This is number 16. Uh, children of Israel in the wilderness after refusing to go to the promised land. 
And some of the people who fancy themselves leaders are getting tired of Moses and Aaron bossing them around. And they come and they say, you take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore, then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. Here's the, the, the myth of democracy or equality or um, everybody's vote is as good as everybody else, or we will have no leaders except those that I agree to. Uh, Dathan and Abiram and, and um, Co what are their names? Korah, Dathan and Abiram are leaders who want the priesthood. But they don't quite say it that baldly. They basically say all of God's people are holy. And so there is no reason that you two should be bossing the rest of us around. We are all kings and priests in Christ, right? So there should be no leaders or captains or priests or anything. But as you read what they're thinking, Aaron, or Moses nails it down. You want the priesthood, don't you? You're trying to tear all this down claiming equality or egalitarianism, but what you really want is power to do what you want to do. And that means ultimately power over other people. So this is the kind of thing we're looking at as we come to uh, contract uh, philosophy or, or theology, because it's both. And, and we ask ourselves, uh, why is it then? A young person, teenager, 20-something, you ask, why do you have to obey the system of government when you never voted for it? Uh, and we need to look briefly at what Locke said, and then we need to look at what would be a more biblical approach to it, and then we need to see why. As if I haven't already dropped the crumbs here, why would anybody follow Locke anyhow? <clears throat> well, I was going to say, briefly looking at Locke, because Locke's argument here is pretty weak sauce. <laughs> 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 okay. But considering that, it's also the best they could come up with. Right. So there's that. My original springboard when I wrote the article behind this was uh, a book that I, ha I, I confess I have not read. It was uh, written by um, Sarah O'Conley, Assistant Professor of Philosophy at Melbourne College. It was in 2012. And uh, the title is Against Autonomy. Justifying coercive paternalism? Question mark. Now, if that was a mouthful, what she goes on to argue is that free will, autonomy, my control of myself, my body, my rights, and such, is highly overrated. And she's not speaking as a Christian; she's speaking as a complete secularist. She's saying, "Yeah, that's all cool and such, but let's face it. First of all, we're not particularly rational creature beings." We don't always want what's logical or do what's logical. So that's kind of, you know, smoke in the eyes anyway. Further, um, the things that we want, we want health and safety and pleasure. And our individual choices don't always get us there because, again, we're not very rational. We eat too much grease. We smoke too many cigarettes. We drink too much alcohol. Wouldn't it be better if people who could see more clearly manage these things for us, thus the paternalism, uh, the nanny state, the fatherland, um, and they they can make these judgments for us. And yes, we're, we're going to have to give up some freedoms here, but we'll be happy. Isn't that what's really important? Happy, safe, healthy? The, the frightening thing is that she's honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a specter yeah. rising like over the over the world, the specter of utilitarianism. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Exactly. Reminds me of that ad that's like you'll own nothing and be happy about it. I forget what that was advertising, but it <laughs> yeah, was that, a real I would thing. like to know what is that an ad for? Oh, the World Economic Fund. Was that an was that a commercial for them? I thought that was just their statement. <laughs> yeah, it was their like, well, I mean, the distinction between advertising and propaganda is uh, <laughs> perhaps academic. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, talking about John Locke, um, some basics for those of you who may not be terribly familiar with him. As I've said before, John Locke was a professing Christian, Trinitarian at that, although he didn't dwell on that publicly very much. He wrote some, some commentaries on scripture, 
which he kept under lock and key until after his death. Uh, seems to have been a nice guy and all, but that's not the issue here. The issue is what he wrote publicly. He lived at a time when um, Europe was in the wake of the wars of religion, religious persecution and all that. And like others, he was looking for some kind of standard that everyone could appeal to. Every rational, good-natured, kind, nice person could look at and say with clarity, ah, here is a starting point, here is a foundation, and it doesn't come down to this text of Scripture or that text, because when we start trying to build on Scripture and interpret Scripture, we end up disagreeing, and we end up killing each other in the name of God. So why can't we find something neutral with respect to God? Now, he was willing to posit a creator of some sort. In his um, treatise on government, he does acknowledge the existence of a creator. He does not name him, does not identify him with the Trinitarian God of Scripture, does not name the use of Christ, or does not use the name of Christ. And um, he does quote from Scripture occasionally, or reference it, but only in the sense that he quotes from lots of ancient sources to say that this is what people in old times thought. Uh, and so he's beginning from self, uh, after the fashion of René Descartes, begin with the autonomous self, and build outward. And uh, this is a quote from, um, I think this is from Second Treaties. Man being, as has been said, by nature, all free, equal, and independent. All right, let's just stop there. By nature, that is, comes from the hand of whoever this creator is, he, all men are free, equal to one another, and independent of one another. We have a word for that. That's called anarchy. There's a lot of definitions that uh, <laughs> haven't been given. <laughs> like, what do you mean by free? What do you mean by equal? I think that's, you know. Yeah, uh, all of those words are up for grabs. I yeah. I often go into spasms over the word equal. I've done so in front of my uh, Bible class before. Uh, it doesn't always come out well because we this idea that all men are created equal is so ground into the American conscience that to even question the wording mm -hmm. can be dangerous. You can be looked upon as an en enemy of freedom. Mm -hmm. um, even to point out that what do you mean equal? Does it mean you're all the same height, same skin color? You all grew up in the same socioeconomic environment? You all grew up in the same year? You all had the same mom and dad? I mean, what, what is this equal? Well, it's in the soul. And as Lewis has Ransom say in that hideous strength, the soul is the place where men are least equal. Hmm. Um, we, do, we all bear the image of God differently, and some souls are bound for heaven and some for hell. So this whole idea of equality is, is a semantic problem. Now, if by equal you mean equally subject to God's law and equally accountable to it, you can go that direction. There may be some other way, equally human in that we're not gods. There, there are other things you can, you can say that to fill it out, but just throwing the word equal out there doesn't mean a thing. Free from, uh, presumably from, from civil government and from one another is what he meant, but um, that's not how most people would understand it exactly today, I would think. Independent, <laughs> again, probably of one another. Anyway, so assume it, this is man's condition. And remember, he's positing a state of nature where this is man's original condition. He is ignoring the Bible at this point. This is not how the Bible says man came to be or how men came to relate to one another. He's ignoring that. I'm just saying, imagine there was a time when there were men on the planet and there were very few, and it's a big planet. And, um, you know, they didn't run into each other very much, if at all, and they all did their own thing. And so that was cool. That was fine. But sooner or later, as the population grows, um, they're going to run into each other. And there's going to be that day when I reach for an apple and you reach for the same apple, and we both look at each other and say, mine, how do we solve that? Do we simply fight for it right there? Do we hope that we're both so, oh, no, after you. No, after you. After you, I insist. No, you suffer. Ah, no. It's, yeah, we're really going to do that. <clears throat> um, so what, what, what happens then? But I don't what, know. That plan kind of worked 
pretty well in the Midwest, I feel like. Oh, no, after you. No, no, you first. <laughs> now, you, you, you found this, uh, this gold mine first. I, I, I wouldn't dream of getting in your... Ah, uh, yeah. Um, well, one thing he says can't happen is that other people can't come along with their already existing civil governments or armies or police force or whatever and take it away from you. If it's yours, it's yours. And he argues about why it's yours. It has to do with the fact that you encountered nature and applied your own effort to it, your own work, because that's something that's uniquely yours. And so it's yours. And someone, no one can take that away. No one can force you to submit to their rules and their laws unless you agree. And so this is what he says next. No one can be put out of this estate and subjected to the political power of another without his own consent. The only, way, the only way whereby anyone divests himself of his natural liberty and puts on the bonds of civil society is by, an agreeing, is by agreeing with other men to join and unite into a community for their comfort, safe, and peaceable living one amongst another in a secure enjoyment of their properties, property, and a greater security against any that are not of it. Protection against outsiders of them. So, here we go. Men run into each other, and they can stand and fight it out. Or they can, if they want to, agree to some kind of, he uses the word bond. Christians would say covenant. He says compact. Others have said contract. Some kind of civil arrangement that does lay bonds, obligations, upon everyone who enters into it. Um, that generates this civil society, this group that is distinct from those outside of the group. And the, the goal of this group is to ensure a comfortable, safe, and peaceable living one amongst another with secure enjoyment of their property. So um, elsewhere, he tells us that the basic rights that every individual has are those of life, liberty, and property. And some have argued that they can all be reduced to property, depending on how you define it. But for our purposes, what we're talking about is this thing of consent. He's saying that nobody has to obey any kind of society or any government founded upon such a society or by such a society unless he's given his consent. So your government can't tell me what to do unless in some fashion, and there's the, the weaseling, um, I have given my consent. Now, the question um, comes, what does that consent look like? Mm. Our thought in 21st century America is I raise my hand and vote or push a button and vote and hope it got tabulated accurately. There are other forms of consent. The law recognizes something called tacit consent. If um, there's a strip of land beside uh, that's part of my property that leads back to your property from the main road. And I let you drive it every day for a couple of years and say nothing and don't try to stop you and don't uh, attempt any legal action. At the end of that time, I have given tacit consent to you doing that, though I've said nothing. And thus, you now have a right to drive that road and to use it in the way you've been using it. So that generalizing, he would say that if you grow up in a country and live there long enough, you've given tacit consent to its laws, you want to vote against it, leave. By the same token, uh, a foreigner coming into a country, by the act of coming into that country, agrees to submit to its laws while he is there, uh, at least insofar as they apply to him. But without the consent, and some of that's a little weaselly, but still, let's give it to him. Without your consent... No one can tell you what to do, or no one has the right, the authority to tell you what to do. And that's what's to hold government together from generation to generation. The fact that a long time ago, a bunch of people that we've never met got together and agreed to something we didn't agree on, and because we're unwilling to get back up and move, we are therefore bound. And um, yeah. Anyone want to point out a couple problems here before... I you well, know, talking too much. Well, the, when, fir the first oh. problem that I can think of is that eventually you're going to get enough people who think I don't agree with this, and then they're going to move, mm -hmm. or they're going to move against you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, it, I was thinking in the American uh, experiment, 
in this field. There was a moment when lots of people did not give their consent and the rest of the people said, too bad, you can't leave. <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's just a whole mythos. But yeah. it, it's just kind of broken. <laughs> <laughs> the, the interesting thing here is that I, as an individual, have these rights and I, as an individual, sign on to this thing for my individual good, although I may have goodwill towards you as well, but primarily it's about my good or the good of me and my family. But once I've signed on to it, everything becomes majority vote because there's no other way to do it. Now, you could, in theory, define percentages, straight majority, two thirds, 90 percent, um, you know, whatever. But at some point, we have to agree on how we who have given up our individual choice to the society as a whole are going to be comfortable with that society making decisions when they aren't ours. What, what happens if I want to be able to eat my McDonald's greasy hamburger freely? And the rest of the country says, no. Or 60% says no, or 50% plus one say, no, you may not. That's bad for your health. We are banning McDonald's from the universe. Is that, didn't I sign on this to keep my rights? And suddenly I have a percentage and perhaps a very small percentage taking away my right to choose. I, I kind of just gave up my autonomy. In the name of autonomy, I gave up my autonomy. And that's kind of where uh, Ms. Connolly is. Aren't there things that are worth giving up your autonomy for? Isn't your health and happiness and the security of your family worth not having a say, not having a voice? And um, the, the problem here is that outside of Christ, there's a real problem. Brian, you made a passing remark earlier. I don't know if you remember it before we started. It was about uh, you being tired of the Enlightenment Oh, yeah, it's a, a meme statement, but it's also kind of true. The Enlightenment project of justifying morality was doomed to fail. Yeah. And that's exactly what we got here. We have Locke trying to justify the fact that you have to, get to, live in a society that you never made under laws that you never legislated, uh, interpreted by courts that you have no hand in. And this is called freedom. Because there's nothing else to appeal to but the majority. And we're going to slide the majority in by saying, but you collectively, individually, in your autonomy, agreed to this. You agreed to give up your autonomy for your safety and security, your pursuit of happiness. And how is that not what Ms. Conley is saying? You've already agreed to give up your autonomy for these things that are good for you, why not let us decide more of what's good for you because you're obviously incompetent and irrational and moved by your guts. You worship your belly. We, however, are, of course, objective and scientists, and we know stuff. And at that point, it becomes kind of hard to refute her except by saying, you know, fascist, fascist, which is not an argument. Uh, I think the only thing I'd like to add is, you know, just kind of based on the general philosophical and practical ramifications of it, we should be able to conclude that the Enlightenment sucked. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, that, mm, mm. Hindsight is twenty twenty. Um, it is. <laughs> like, it do be. Yeah. So I think it's tricky to. You know, it's it's easy to fault Locke and his Enlightenment buddies um, for departing from Scripture, and I think that's pretty much the only thing that it's fair to fault him for, as well as the philosophers that followed, because they're asking questions that Scripture has an answer for, and they're really fair questions giving it. Yeah given everything that preceded them. So when we get to Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, and it's like, well, this all flowed from the Enlightenment, it's like, 
Yeah, and it's kind of logical. Like it <laughs> makes sense that they would go where they went. Oh, it's absolutely um, logical. Right. And irrational so, at the same time, but that's a different topic. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I think there's there's a lot to be gained from maybe this is a little bit of a tangent. It's definitely a little bit of a tangent, but from reading these philosophers and seeing how they defeat their own mm. their own underpinnings. Yeah. Um, as well as, you know, just reading them for fun and saying, I feel like we would have been friends, which is how I feel about <laughs> Kierkegaard. <laughs> yeah, I actually feel like I'd be more friends with Kierkegaard than Locke, but you know, that's just me. <laughs> the um, There's a book I, I have mentioned before, I may even have recommended it, although I do so with a grain of salt. And I believe it's called The Heavenly City of the maybe 18th Century Philosophers. I don't remember exactly. Oh, I remember you've mentioned this before. Yeah. The, the whole book is, it was written, I think, in the 1920s by someone who considered himself a systemologically self-aware, some professor, someplace. I don't care. He's not famous to anybody, <laughs> now, rightly so. But what he points out is that the early Enlightened philosophers were in protest against what they saw as the abuses of Christendom. The Inquisition, the wars of religion, um, any anything that just was um, unjust, unkind. And what, they, what they're doing, of course, is they're holding up a Christian standard to measure mm -hmm. Christendom by. Mm -hmm. But rather than conclude that Christians are, one, inconsistent, <laughs> two, hypocrites, Three, don't know their Christianity very well. They jump to the, and of course, this means God does not exist, <laughs> or at least not their God. And so they go on to talk about, they begin to build systems that will generate, I don't know if any of them ever said it, but a heavenly city, a new Jerusalem, mm -hmm. a utopia, paradise on earth. Um, a tower and, to reach onto the heavens. Yeah. <laughs> but they actually thought they could do it. They actually mm -hmm. thought they could maintain what they saw as the best parts of Christian morality and reject Christ and God and the Bible and salvation. Uh, and in fact, they saw those things as superstitions that were getting in the way. If we got rid of that and just focused on the morality, the best parts of it, then we can have our heavenly city. And this man who's writing the book in the 1920s is saying, my, weren't they silly? Weren't they foolish? Weren't they inconsistent? Couldn't they see that in rejecting Christianity, they had to reject all of it? But no, they were inconsistently holding on to Christian morality. Uh, they should have seen that it's not necessary in order to get a better world. And shouldn't we weep over them and their foolishness? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I, I, this is, there's truth there, at least in some cases, uh, in some cases, I think it was, it was a genuine confusion a mental confusion. In some cases it was self-deception. I can think here of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, for instance, who writes books on how to raise your children and puts all of his in orphanages, but it, it, with more and more time, by the time we get to say the 1840s and Marx, it's pretty plain where we're going here. We're rejecting Christian morality. We have no God, but, well, we say the people, the majority, but what it means is somebody has to speak for the majority, and that someone is an elite, as Dr. Schaefer warned us a number of times. Uh, they may be an elected elite. They may be a self-appointed elite. They may be a technocratic elite. They may be a philosophical or religious elite, but somebody's going to stand up and say, we represent the common will, the general will of the people. We know what's best for everybody. And whether you actually voted for us or not is not the point. We know what's best. And since this whole majoritarian thing is you're surrendering to what's best for everybody, well, we'll decide for you. Or please let us decide, depending how early we are in the struggle. And we're at the point now where that seems logical to people. That sounds right. Uh, yeah, we want the right thing. So the government will, wait, what happened to the we here? What happened to individual responsibility? What happened to, um, say, a personal voluntary act, like giving money to a particular charity that you vetted, rather than saying to the state, 
tax us, meaning tax everybody else, and you give us the kind of thing that will make us all happy. Those are two very different things. One is individualistic to a degree, although still operating, one presumes, within the laws of the land. The other is a, is a complete surrender of autonomy, of individual freedom, choice, and responsibility in the name of safety and security, or as Schaefer used to say, personal peace and affluence. Mm -hmm. just, mm -hmm. just, just give me what I need, will make me happy, will keep me safe, give me my drugs and my sexual perversity and plenty of entertainment on the internet, and um, hey, I'm good. I'm good. Well, sure, because after that, everything outside doesn't matter because yeah. you're <laughs> left alone in your ho in your home, and that's it. Yeah, and we really, despite the fact that we protest how much we care, we don't really care. We don't find ourselves going out of the street and talking to people with real needs. We find ourselves yelling at people who aren't doing what we think and asking the government to punish them somehow or control them or regulate them or something like that. Now, the in passing, we do need, and, and you both, I think, were kind of hinting at this earlier, the role of the church. These people, you say, had good questions. Yeah, I did. And to simply say, well, you are an unbelieving blank, 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 and we don't need to talk to you or, or read your books or even think about you is not necessarily helpful. Sometimes it may be. But more generally, <laughs> when the questions are are legitimate, this is a time to stop and listen and say, all right, yeah, I understand your question, and say either, and here is the biblical answer, or to say, oh, I'm not sure what the biblical answer is to that. That is indeed a piercing, profound question worthy of time and study. Give me a year or two, and I'll get back to you. But what I won't do is drop you or insult you or call you names because you dared to ask something that I can't deal with. Uh, what's even worse is to sort of, as it were, join their side while not admitting it. And at the time where the Enlightenment is moving into Romanticism, we see, for instance, in the preaching of Finney, I use him as a whipping boy. There were certainly many others who were guilty of this, but he he's famous. It's the price you pay. <laughs> Uh, Finney saying that this, this thing called salvation, this thing called the kingdom of God is wholly and completely your choice. And it's your choice moment by moment. You can be a Christian today and not be a Christian tomorrow and then become a Christian the day after based on what you choose to do. Christ is our example, but this whole thing of justification by faith and regeneration that is a new nature are out of court because man has no fixed nature. Man is what he makes himself to be. He's, he's, Ooh foreseeing existentialism, although not under that name. Um, well, and I think that's a great place to uh, tie it back to the beginning where you're discussing, you know, what is, what kind of equality are we talking about? And if mm -hmm. you basically take the tack of Finney and say, look, there's no such thing as a fixed human nature. It's always changing, even according to your own will. And that means that over time, it's definitely changing yeah. uh, for humanity then there is no such thing as equality, no matter how much they say so. And the, I, I think the best way for the Christian to look at equality is as not not just before God, before before or in reference to the law, but also in regards to the human nature that we all possess. We all possess the same kind of human nature, and when you like I said, take the tack of Finney, you end up destroying one of the only basises, bases for human equality that exists. Yeah. You're in, you're, as you can constantly redefine yourself, uh, yeah, I like your point that you, you're making yourself into something that may be wholly unlike what you used to be and wholly unlike what everyone else is. And isn't yeah. this uh, in harmony with the next step? in intellectual history, which is evolution. Some of us are more evolved than others. Some of us have made useful choices. What was the word you used earlier, the philosophy, utilitarian choices uh, than others have? And, and so that's going to leave us with some real problems. Sort of along those lines, but not completely, was uh, his response when asked about children who die in infancy. Are such souls saved? He was a little taken back by the question because he didn't really have an answer. And he basically said, well, they're not capable of rational moral choice. So they're hardly to be considered souls at all. 
But I suppose if if God were going to do something for such beings, yes, he would bring them to heaven, because why not? But not really my ball of wax. Nice. Um, and, and that says something very profound, that humanity is defined by its ability to make choices that we can perceive, that we outsiders perceive. We can't perceive the child in the womb making choices. We can't perceive oh, a little baby like Gretchen here making very many choices, at least none of them profound. <laughs> Certainly, we cannot see um, the child choosing Christ. And so we begin to reckon the child is less than human because humanity is wrapped up in this, this rationalistic intellectual autonomy, whereby out of my, my rationality, I make choices that at least ought to make sense. Now, what happens if that kind of theology percolates through American culture, religious culture, and churches for about 200 years, where we get to the point where we're told God's decree is not the issue here. What's at issue is your choice. Come forward. God Almighty now stands hope, helpless. You and you only can save your soul. Now, I don't know if any of you ever heard anything like that in your years growing up. I've heard some things pretty close to it over Christian radio. Uh, I don't think it maybe is rampant as it was once upon a time, but this exalting of, of man's free will um, to the point where even God stands back and says, whoa, can't mess with that. This, this is part of this whole picture. Until the individual gives consent, nobody can say anything. And if I, if the state tries to pass a law that I haven't consented to, if the church leaders make an enactment that I haven't consented to, if mom and dad do something, make a decision for the family that I haven't consented to, then I have the idea that I am absolutely just and fair. I'm the one sinned against because they didn't ask my say. They didn't ask me what I want to do. Mm. And when our very evangelical theology is is resounding with that, it's kind of hard to stop and say, wait, you've missed something here. And the thing that we really haven't said, and now in closing, I think is the time to say it, there is a God in heaven who grants authority and holds men accountable and writes a law that we don't get to kibitz about. We don't get to decide whether or not that law is applicable to us. Now, we have to understand how it's applicable to us, but that's not the same thing. It's not, we don't have the decision of, well, God wrote that for uh, uncivilized people 3,000 years ago. Mm. I don't, it doesn't bind me. I am a new person in a new age and I have computers and, and other things. So I can make my own rules. I can make my own law. And even God doesn't dare tell me what to do. And if any of you think you know what God says and what God means, well, you're fascists because you're trying to tell me, you're trying to trample on my authority, my autonomy, my personal authority over me. And that means that you are evil. And speaking as an elder in a church that is reformed and that uh, nonetheless has had many discipline problems over the years while I've been on board, um, this happens. People look at us and say, no, mm -mm, we're out of here. That you, you don't get to decide that. Um, kind of do. Nope. Mm -mm, bye. <laughs> we're actually, we're lucky if they say bye sometimes. <laughs> but it's this is something that's, that's true in, in civil government. And it's true in families. Kids who wake up one day and say, mom and dad, you're not the boss of me. Yeah, there's the son of your father and mother thing. Now oh, that's so old fashioned. Yeah, and old fashioned is another word for ancient. That used to be good. It's not now. It's not. An old fashioned is a great cocktail. You should take a lesson from that for. Like, all of you, <laughs> <know>. <laughs> oh, but I don't think that's mixed with equal parts, is it? <laughs> oh, <laughs> bum, bum, bum. and with that, we will wrap up this again, pointing out that uh, if we, there is a standard, a moral standard by which the world must run. It's God's word. And although we can disagree about details and what goes where and what does that mean now, that's a far cry from saying, God speaks to me in my heart and you and your Bible have nothing to say to me. Uh, uh, society's salvation, its temporal health, lies in learning to live by every word of God, to be taught every word that Jesus has commanded. That's our commission. The power is in the Holy Spirit. And we must never confuse those. If we try to think that mere education is going to change things, 
we become rationalists. But there is content and there is word from God, but the Holy Spirit must supply the transforming power through that word. And so we must not be ashamed ever of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hmm. Amen. Well, that is a wonderful place to end. Let's do recommendations. I'll go first. I'm ready. All right. Um, I have probably recommended this before, um, but I recommend it today out of a from a new place in life. That's morning oh. walks. Gretchen does much better on a day when we take a morning walks. Take a morning okay. walk, and I find that I am much happier when we take a morning walk. And here it's really <laughs> hot, so it's nice to do it early and appreciate the morning. I'm not a morning person, but morning walks are nice. I I used to not be that much of a morning person, and to an extent, I still am not. But getting up earlier in the day, which has mainly happened due to um, Emily's job first, and then later when I found a job that was not remote, um, it it is a better start to the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's really wonderful. Totally. Um, I wish I could feel your pleasure. I haven't got that. <laughs> <laughs> well, except I, I, except on trips to Europe, because then we were so our whole uh, sense of time was so off that you automatically <laughs> got up about three hours earlier in the morning. Oh no! <laughs> of course, there's there's also like to freak people out even more. I don't drink coffee either, mm. so I just <laughs> I just get up and I do it by myself. <laughs> wow, I'm impressed. Wow. Yeah. I for a while I was forcing myself to drink a four o'clock cup of coffee in the afternoon because it would get to be nine o'clock and Gretchen would be fussy and we couldn't get her down. And I was just so much more patient if I had (laughs) had that four o'clock cup of coffee. (laughs) Nice. Okay. Um, I have two. One is literary and one is culinary. Culinary is I'm going to recommend kebabs. Oh, yeah. Grilling mm-hmm. kebabs. We did some of those last night for dinner. And I think there's a, a quite a lot of prep work that goes into it. Just all the slicing and, and dicing and cutting. But it was very good. Um, we did like an Asian marinated chicken with bell pepper, onion, zucchini, and pineapple slices. and Or chunks, I should say. Very good. Uh, my literary recommendation, I actually... Uh, talked with Greg about it at the end of our last episode recording. I hadn't finished the book yet, so I didn't feel like I should recommend it. But I finished it now. It's called Walkability or Walkable Cities. The author's oh. name is Jeff Speck. And yeah. it's very it's very interesting as a read. I really enjoyed it. I came away basically going, wow, I really agree with everything this guy said. And it's about how cities in the United States in the past... 60, 70 years, basically, have all been rebuilt, re- remodified. Their their facades have been refacaded, uh, mm. specifically for the purpose of making it more friendly to vehicles. And that in the long run, while you might bring in more people from out of town for jobs, you're ultimately not going to have a city that anyone wants to actually live in. Mm. Um, So he talks about different things, different um, strategies to basically help make your streets more pedestrian friendly, bicyclist friendly, and essentially give the people who actually live in your city, the option of whether or not they want to own a car in the first place. And he basically also says like, we're not out to get rid of cars He's like, I even love cars. I, I've driven like the newest car that is the fastest um, every three years or so because uh, I love cars and I could afford it. But it is to to try and make cities a bit more car optional and car, mm-hmm. I guess, car allow- allowable, but mainly to prioritize foot traffic for the people who actually live within distance of of the places that you want them to go. And, you know, from a, a very practical monetary point of view to go spend their money in your district. (laughs) And then there's more stuff where it's like the law of supply and demand also applies to things like traffic lanes, (laughs) parking spaces, et cetera. So if you, if you build more lanes, if you spend millions of dollars adding uh, a third lane to all of your city highways, 
they're going to fill up again because you've they're, just made it easier to drive. Yeah, they're free. Mm-hmm. They're free. There's they're, a demand and it's a zero price. So Yes. Yeah. And, and the same thing applied to parking spaces in front of um, businesses that were you know, in, in downtown or, or anywhere, really, is if you make all the parking free after a certain amount of time, I, I, he, he gave an example, which was, if you have paid parking in your downtown area from eight to five, and then all the people who live nearby snag the free parking once it becomes free after five, then all the people who just drove in from out of town to go to dinner, to go to a fancy dinner, don't have anywhere to park and they may decide oh well you know it's only 10 minutes to go to this other place that's out of town yeah. so we'll just go spend our money there anyway it was all very interesting and i was very fascinated by the statistics presented uh i'll just the name again is um walkable city how downtown can save america one step at a time it's dramatic oh, subtitle oh. <laughs> dramatic um, and the author is jeff speck um, I remember seeing that book and thinking, boy, I really want to read that because it probably confirms all my biases. <laughs> but like, I Bias, love how... that was the word I was looking for earlier. Oh, <laughs> there you go. Um, the way that I have experienced small towns versus medium sized towns versus small cities versus large cities is always sort of in terms of how you interact with the people. And so I really loved living in a small town where you'd walk everywhere because when you're walking, there's nothing to insulate you to give you this illusion of being separate from the people you encounter. Yeah. So it's like when you're, when you live in a walkable, a walkable city, quote unquote, you run into people that, you know, because everybody's occupying sort of the same limited space, which is just a really nice thing for community and, you know, feeling connected, which is yeah important. <laughs> I and not I only run into people that you know, you run into people that you don't know, but you exactly. keep running into them. Right. And then you know them. <laughs> and then you know them. Like, there's one gentleman around here who walks his dog. The dog is a German shepherd named Bear. I know this because after the girls saw uh, Bear and his owner a number of times, I rolled down the window as we stopped at a corner and said, beautiful animal. Thank you, sir. What's his name? Bear. Thank you. <laughs> and we drove off, you know. But, you know, that that's now a fixed person in our reality. Yeah. And plus dog. Uh, <laughs> there were there were two um, funny anecdotes he listed where he said one is like, now I may come across a bit biased uh, in favor of walkability and this kind of sense of community that you get because I happen to meet my wife by happenstance. <laughs> and I was like, that's adorable. Uh, and the other one was also interesting. I, I feel like with very good cause, a lot of the time, we tend to view cities with suspicion. And that's mainly because of things like The fact they're all blue, uh, (laughs) politically speaking. Or the fact that the major ones that everyone knows about are deep, deep blue uh, Mm -hmm. from the bottom of the ocean. Uh, And not pleasant places to be. (laughs) And not pleasant places. Um, They're they're kind of going against the things that made them great places to live in the first place. But Mm -hmm. um, interestingly enough, the author even said, it's like, if you want... To remain competitive as a city, like he's just talking, not not necessarily to people like me who are reading the book there, but like city ma- uh, mayors and and things like that, people in authority. And he basically says, um, you should try to become more competitive as a city by offering this kind of deep community, but the community will only be there if they feel safe walking there, basically. Mm. And he goes, uh, otherwise... San Francisco and Portland and Miami and New York will all continue to aggregate young people who who gravitate to them for that sense of community and more normal cities will not. <laughs> I just thought that was so funny. Just like He's like he gets it even he knows they're weird. <laughs> mm. Well, I have spent the last half hour hour now trying to come up with some great recommendation. And this is a good recommendation. It's just not something that I came up with after an hour. It just kind of materialized in my head. It's this. Teach your kids to cook. (laughs) That's it. Teach your kids. This this requires, of course, you knowing how to cook yourself. (laughs) But um, 
And I can expand that and to be homemakers, house cleaners in general, both boys and girls. Yes. Yeah. Um, this, this, this is something that's important. As Brian's been telling us about his uh, adventures in moving into this new house and uh, modifying it. I've been impressed more than once at his ability to take on all kinds of strange things that I really wouldn't <laughs> know how to do and make them work and look good. Somehow. But uh, bringing it back down to just a simple everyday, um, you, your children should be able to land in a kitchen and fix a meal for four or five people, and it should taste good. And it should, there should be more than one. <laughs> not, not just making an eggs. <laughs> not there, just there mac and cheese immense, from a box. <laughs> there's, there's not only the immense practical benefit of being able to do that, mm -hmm. but also, I don't like using this phrase because it always feels like transactional, but like, you will win, young men, you will win points with your wife if you are <laughs> able to <laughs> vacuum and dust and do basic house cleanliness things. Mm -hmm. It doesn't all have to be in one big show thing no. where it's like, oh, it's piled up for weeks and now I got to do all this work. It can be a, over the course of a day. It's like, oh, I just noticed I put something here and I need to clean it up and, or whatever. And that wins you more points than the, oh, now the it's thing. intolerable. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the, the daily, not just knowing how to, but actually having actually to do it. it. Yeah. And then uh, also on top of that, it's like if you know how to cook, you can you can like show your love for your wife by cooking a meal for her mm -hmm. or by doing a fancy dinner night at home. And uh, for for my wife, who is um, for all practical purposes, Dutch in all but ethnicity, uh, <laughs> being able to cook something at home, it's a it's a weight off the mind because it's not going out and spending money. Uh, yeah. All the stereotypes of Dutch people are true, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Dutch can confirm. <laughs> yes. So it it you know there, there's multiple facets here. If you will, if you know how to cook for yourself, not only will you benefit greatly you can benefit your spouse you can benefit your family when you have children as well and you know mom is tired from taking care of the kids all day and food is not done not that i know that from personal experience i have no children yet but <laughs> um you know you can save money it, it's nice to be able to know how to use your resources in a way that is not a drain basically and speaking I, I from the other come with the warning that if you <laughs> learn to cook and cook well and like plate well <laughs> you might be dissatisfied with every restaurant meal ever <laughs> this is we, true <laughs> we have multiple times sat down to eat something taken a bite and gone why do we eat out <laughs> to which the answer is i didn't have to cook it and more to the yep. point i don't have to clean up after exactly, <laughs> exactly. That that's where that we all end for. up uh, one one other thing, speaking from the other end, as when your children come of age and they can go into other places and cook, mm. it gives them a sense of being grown ups, of of mm -hmm. having it together, of knowing what's going on, yep. rather than being complete incompetence and mm -hmm. saying, "Why can everybody else do this practical stuff and I don't know how?" And when when other other moms in other houses say to their children, "Get out of the way, I'm going to sit here with your friends and cook." Uh, it, does, it does send a signal of what my parents did something right, I guess. And I know what I'm doing. Why don't they? Mm. And good. I get to, con I have some control over this meal. I'm going to have to eat here in a moment so I can uh, make sure it's not too weird. So there are all <laughs> kinds of, um, all kinds of advantages. So yeah, it turned into a good conversation. So it must be a good recommendation. Right? <laughs> Teach your kids yes. to cook. All right. Uh, thank you so much for the recommendations. Thanks for joining us. If you'd like to follow us, you can do so on YouTube through Rumble. You can follow our very inactive, I think, at the moment, Facebook page. Uh, moderately inactive. Moderately inactive is yeah. uh, the, the new word that we're going for. <laughs> um, do we do we, like post episodes there? Is that what we do I, at this I point? I think so. Okay. We might <laughs> even have transcripts. No. Oh, no. David's <laughs> shaking his head at me. Never mind. Never mind. Okay. Uh, yeah. So the Substack, we'll, we'll, though. We're on Substack we'll now. Oh, we're on Substack now. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, so there as well. Uh, you can also uh, subscribe to the show through any podcast catcher if you want to stay up to date on each new episode as it comes out. Um, if you would like to reach out to us, uh, give us 
your questions or suggestions for episodes, we'd be happy to hear them. Uh, our email is haltingtowardzion at gmail.com. If you would like to support us financially, you can do so at anchor.fm forward slash haltingtowardzion. Thank you so much to all of you who do financially support us. You help make the show become a possibility, become a reality. And a thanks to David Maxson for doing all the producing work and editing all the episodes and basically running everything else besides hosting the show. So big hats off to David. We hope to see you next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs>